motor cars were designed to provide a new form of personal transport. But before long, they were used for other purposes. This car, with more than a hundred others, took part in one of the early motor races run between the great cities of Europe, the Paris-Vienna 1902. And the new cinematograph is there to record its dusty progress. Most of these cars are standard touring models and are driven by gentlemen who are only too pleased to show off their new machines. But there are also many specially built racing cars made to an internationally accepted weight limit of one ton. Manufacturers build faster and faster cars by putting larger and larger engines in light chassis. These cars, capable of speeds of up to 90 miles an hour, give some of the most exciting and dangerous racing ever known. France at this time is supreme, and here comes one of her greatest drivers, the Chevalier René de Nif on his Panard. But the great de Nif fails to finish the Paris-Vienna race, and an Englishman, S.F. Edge, takes the coveted Gordon Bennett Trophy to Britain. The Irish Gordon Bennett is a real international competition, with teams from Germany, the United States, Britain and France. is over seven laps of a closed circuit. Only a few weeks ago, the city-to-city -city races had come to a terrible halt after a disastrous attempt to run a race from Paris to Madrid. The race is to be run over a total distance of 327 miles, and the Panard, driven by Denis, is confidently expected to take the trophy back to France. the unexpected is happening once more and a German Mercedes driven by Janazzi is faster. Commonly called the Red Devil, Janazzi is better known for courage than success but at last his day has come. French cars are second, third and fourth. But the Gordon Bennett trophy goes on to Germany. Genazzi's erratic brilliance does much to make Mercedes the car of the year. Next year, special trials are needed to select Gordon Bennett teams, as more and more manufacturers realize that racing is a shortcut to fame. British hopes are centered on Edge's Napier. Tires are a great problem and have to be cooled whenever possible. Britain also has new streamlined Wolfsbys. The German team is to be led by Genazzi, the undoubted favorite. While the Italians have Cagno, their queen's personal chauffeur. The Germans have chosen the Taunus, building fantastic stands to look like a medieval castle, and even translating the inscriptions in the post office into Latin. On this grand occasion, the Kaiser himself is up at six in the morning for the start. Genazzi leads off for Germany. Edge follows. Genazzi is determined to win. He has been practicing every day for two months. The circuit is 80 miles with towns that are neutralized. Cars stop and are then paced through by cyclists. It is noted that the French braziers move more smoothly and hold the road better than the Mercedes with their undamped springs. It's not easy to appreciate the drama of seeing the giants for the first time. To liken a locomotive to a car, says one account, is sheer bathos. 
It is as the gamboling of an elephant to the flight of a swallow. It's a shock to the Germans when Terry's brazier is found to be fastest of all and steadily drawing away from Janetsky. Britain is close behind. Italy is also coming into the picture with Canio's Fiat number 17. It is reported that when other drivers wave, Canio, the chauffeur, salutes respectfully. Lap after lap for nearly six hours, Terry keeps up his magnificent drive. Genetzi cannot match the fantastic regularity of the French car. At long last, the Gordon Bennett Trophy goes back to France. From now onwards, Terry is to be known as the chronometer. The following year, he wins again. And now France exploits her supremacy by organizing a new race on her own terms. The French Grand Prix is to be a two-day affair of 800 miles the finest possible test of men and machines. There are new Fiat's from Italy and Mercedes from Germany. Designers still concentrate on large engines in light chassis. The 14 and a half liter Mercedes engine is just about twice as big as that of a London bus. Hotchkiss have gone so far as to fit light wire wheels. of this car as it is officially weighed. The Dedetrix are probably near the ton weight limit with their 18-litre engines. Clément's son Albert is having his first big race on 13A, a Clément Bayard. Numbers are allocated to mix. 5A is a brazier, so are 5B and 5C. There are no less than 23 French cars among the starters. Gabriel leads off the front. Lancia of Italy is on a Fiat. That's a new Renault. this race a test of men as well as machines, all work must now be done by the crew. This is just the start of a two-day race. The circuit is made up of three very long, flat-out straights. It is above all a test of sustained high speed. Although there are the connecting corners. Organization is on the grand scale with 40 miles of palisading alone. As the first results come through, a brazier is again in the lead with Barra driving. While the leading Hotchkiss has broken a wheel on the first lap. Lancia, the hope of Italy, comes in. A keen singer, he is said to detect a false note in an engine as easily as in one of his favorite Wagnerian scores. The entire radiator seems to be out of harmony today. The Italas are also off tune. And it is Seitz who takes the lead for France with a Renault. Braziers are second and third. The heat is becoming subtropical, but already the French lead is overwhelming. The first day's racing is more than halfway through when Leblanc finishes rebuilding his wheel with spokes borrowed, it is said, not only from his wheels, but even from other competitors.
This is becoming a real test of physical endurance. The fine particles of dust combine with the dust-laying liquid to hurt the driver's eyes so severely that several can hardly see the road and have to retire. Just before midday, the waiting crowd see the leader come in. In first place sits the ex-mechanic. And second, the youngest competitor, Albert Clément. Next morning, the race is continued. Sitz leads comfortably, but the complete French victory crumbles as the Italian driver, Felice Nazaro, takes second place. Young Albert's in trouble. He has to change tires on fixed wheels, whereas the Fiat's and Renault's have detachable rims. His car is not only fast, but he can change a tire in two minutes, compared with up to 15 minutes of this. Poor Albert Clement is dropping further and further behind the Italian Fiat. The wooden road, specially built to skirt the town of Saint Calais, is tricky. Shepard, an American amateur, was fourth. Albert's back, trying to catch the Fiat. While a brazier is now fourth. The American is out. Another wire wheel has collapsed. And there just don't seem to be enough spokes left on any of the others. Today, no one can catch the Renault. And Sitz waves to the crowd as he drives on with a lead of over 30 minutes on Lazaro. The first Grand Prix is in every way a success for France. The Renault wins, while Nazaro's second place for Italy in the Fiat gives a pleasant international flavor. There is a new racing star, an ex-racing mechanic. The professionals are moving in. Germany counters the successful French Grand Prix by putting all her imperial splendor behind a race of her own, the Kaiser Prize. A large number of people still have little apparent idea of the danger involved, which is a big problem on these long circuits. Many who should know better still turn their back on the motor car's rapid progress. This time, Germany has drawn up regulations on her terms, excluding the large French and Italian Grand Prix cars. All the same, there is a strong competition from abroad, and for half the 300-mile race, a Belgian peat leaves. Then, on the very last lap, Felici Nazaro comes through to win on his red Italian Fiat. The unlucky Belgian finds that he is now nearly five minutes behind. Germany can do no better than third. The race is not repeated. The Kaiser presents the prizes, not only to the drivers and to the designers, but also to the directors of the companies involved. Right on top of this comes the French Grand Prix at the end. weight limit was dangerous, and the organizers have hit on a depressingly sensible formula, a limit on fuel consumption. It's all done most carefully, but motor racing is spectacular, particularly with flamboyant characters in the German and Italian teams, with the hard-driving Lancia, and that most brilliant new star of all, Felici Nazaro the son of a Turian coal merchant who is said to handle a car like a violin. To economize the limited fuel, cars are started at the last moment, 
and several are in trouble. As soon as the race is on, all thoughts of careful economical driving are forgotten. The new formula hasn't had much effect. Two drivers have been killed in practice on these giant lightweights. One of them, young Albert Clément. Many drivers are finding the new circuit difficult. Racing encourages new and experimental cars. But this veteran, Cobrambier, is in her fifth season. It is not a Mercedes here. And the braziers now seem to be outclassed. Italy has taken the lead. It's Wagner on a Fiat, and he's overdone it. His lead was less than seven seconds over Dure's French Lorraine Dietrich. Pablo on a brazier is trying hard. A Renault is touched by the brazier. Pablo has bent the front axle, but the car is driving. It's a Lorraine Dietrich leading for France, but Lancia's Fiat is only seconds behind. Felice Nazaro, with a gentlemanly salute, is third. The speed of this car is understandable. Like several others, they're finding the detachable rims too detachable. Racing has become tougher and more professional, but it's still usually friendly. It's traditional to try and finish, even after losing two and a half hours. With a fabulous drive on the Lorraine Dietrich, Dure still leads for France. But the pace is now telling on Lancia's Fiat. French cars are second and third. With only two laps to go, Dure is out. And first place has been taken for Italy by Felici Nazaro on his Fiat. Felici, the winner of the Kaiser Prize, wins the French Grand Prix. The next Grand Prix is again at Dieppe and starts with a bang. Solzer immediately takes the lead for Germany and loses it. But it's depressing to clear to the French crowd that this year the white German cars are very fast. And a Benz now leads. There's no fuel limit this year, but a minimum weight limit of just over one ton. The idea of the minimum weight is that heavier cars will be safer. Unfortunately, Heavy cars have a strong tendency to keep moving in a straight line. The German cars are overwhelmingly successful, although even Lautenschlager on the leading Mercedes makes his mistake. Lautenschlager still has a lead of eight minutes when he goes on to win. German cars are first, second and third. The race is a complete German victory and the defeat of France is hard to take. This might well be the end of the French Grand Prix.
but motor racing is not dead. Brooklands, opened in 1907, gives a great impetus to British manufacturers with its opportunities for sustained high speed. Percy Lambert's Talbot is the first car to do 100 miles in the hour. Track racing is also popular in the States, where trotting tracks are used for regular meetings. One British writer refers to this as a most unsafe procedure. In Europe, it's more gentlemanly. Even if it's not quite the thing to put your passenger nearest to the accident. Amateur sport is always popular in Britain. And at Chelsley Walsh, almost anyone can have a go. But it isn't just fun, and many useful lessons are learned the hard way. Observe the stability of this car. Now compare a Leon Peugeot, a fast car with a high engine and center of gravity. These small cars, called watcherettes, are being highly developed. At first, people looked down on them, saying they should be kept for shopping and local touring. There is an air of the more cheerful British amateur racing of the day, as one of the crew dives beneath a seat, produces a magneto, and looks as if he doesn't know quite what to do next. This way of spending your time demands real enthusiasm. The sheer guts of these men is realized when we see how they try to go on racing whenever possible. Surprisingly few people are seriously hurt. However, one accident at Encore Bridge has become legend. lifted from the wreck to be taken to the mortuary. When the driver was placed on the cold slab, he is said to have risen up and indignantly demanded his motor car. By 1908, this watcherette is winning a 300-mile race in under six hours non-stop. Louis de Large appears to have bashed by his sudden fame to thank Guillaume. Less happy is the Grand Prix story. The death of one of the great pioneers, Maurice Fournier, mars a gallant attempt to revive Grand Prix racing at Le Mans in 1911. Unluckily, only number 13, a Fiat, completes the full distance. However, Grand Prix racing is to return the following year with new giant Fiats from Italy. French Peugeots with engines of only half their size and valuable experience from their voiturette racing. The British sunbeams are much smaller still. It's quite like old times as a giant Fiat goes into the lead round the old Dieppe circuit. That is drama again at Encore Bridge. The racing, however, is different. The smaller Peugeots are setting a new standard in road holding. While the three-litre sunbeams come in third, fourth, and fifth. Louis Wagner's Fiat is second. But it and all the other giants have been decisively defeated by a blue Peugeot. The driver, Georges Boileau, becomes overnight one of the legendary figures of motor racing. In 1913, the Peugeot engine is reduced further in size, and Boileau is the star driver. Moreover, on the new short 20-mile circuit at Amiens, the road holding of the Peugeot and the skill of Boileau are at a premium. The challenge comes from Delage. One of these new round-nosed cars laps at over 76. The British sunbeams are again well up, and one finishes third. It is the Peugeot road holding that defeats all others. Another British
brilliant drive by Georges Boileau brings a second victory to France. French confidence grows as a race for Grand Prix cars at Le Mans gives the Delage a chance to prove themselves. To the excitement of everyone, the Mercedes are back. But the white German cars cannot catch the French. Bablo wins. This time, Louis Delage isn't so bashful. The French industry is right back on top as the stage is set for the last act of our story the 1914 French Grand Prix. This is to be one of the greatest motor races of all time, with cars from nearly every motor manufacturing company in the world. Sits, the ex-mechanic is back. So is Cagno, the royal chauffeur. Felici Nazaro with the sensitive hands. And most exciting of all, Lautenschlager on a new Mercedes is meeting the great George Boileau on his Peugeot. The new circuit is near Lyon, and for additional spectacle, the cars are to start in pairs. See how Siler's white Mercedes walks away from Cagno. At the end of the first lap, it is George Boileau of France who leads the pack. Then, to the dismay of the crowd, a white German Mercedes is fastest of all. Siler leads, Boileau is second, on that dramatic day in the summer of 1914, the crowd line the short, twisting 23-mile circuit. This is a real test of a racing car and of the engineering skill of the nations involved. The German car leads, but French cars are close behind. Boileau is second, and number 35, Durez de Large, is third. British and Italian cars are behind, battling among themselves, when suddenly, after only six of the 25 laps, Siler and a second Mercedes are out. Boileau leads, and another Peugeot, 19, is fourth. The blue Peugeots, with their tails cocked high, seem to gain yards on every corner. Large number nine cannot match the Peugeot. Then the three remaining Mercedes start coming through the field, and the race is nearly halfway through when Lautenschlager comes into second place. to go and he leads by nearly two and a half minutes. Then in the last laps tension grows and the crowd realize that the Mercedes are steadily gaining ground. The final lap and as the cars stream home the blue car is missing. Barlow's out. Schlager wins with Mercedes first, second and third. The German victory is complete. The heroic days of the pioneers are over. But the great racing cars will never be forgotten. The fragile but powerful cars that demanded so much strength, physical endurance and courage as men raced with them over hundreds of miles of dusty roads half a century ago.